story, I mean, games are doing very much the same thing. We see games kind of diversifying and spreading out through all these different niches as well. Uh, there's also this generational kind of shift from people that spend a lot of time with linear entertainment, story entertainment, to interactive, and that wave is slowly moving across, you know, and we still have this big generational divide right now. Uh, when I was growing up, we only had three channels of television, and so they're very much limited to the kind of stuff that I could watch. Uh, so I ended up watching a lot of bad TV, honestly, uh, because there wasn't much else on TV. But at the same time, I ended up seeing a lot of really amazing, cool things that I probably would not have chosen to see otherwise. They just happened to be coming on, so I ended up watching them, and then realizing how brilliant Alfred Hitchcock was, for instance. Um, then as television started going to cable, we started getting much more programming. We started fracturing a bit. And then eventually went to digital cable, hundreds of you know, channels. And that's had a big impact on kind of the way audiences are collected and the way franchises and story worlds are built. Uh, the original Beverly Hillbillies in 1963 had a viewership of around 20 million people. Uh, television peaked probably at Dallas, around 27 million people in 1980. Now a big hit today, like Lost, actually gets a viewership of about 16 million people. Less than the Beverly Hillbillies did in 1963. If you look at the economics of it, Lost costs about $2.5 million an episode. Uh, and I did a lot of web searching, but I couldn't find the exact figure. But I can guarantee that the Beverly Hillbillies is a whole lot less than $2.5 million an episode. Um, in fact, I think it was probably like $50,000 an episode. Now, also, you get this weird dynamic where so many people have seen the Beverly Hillbillies or Dukes of Hazard that people are making big budget movies about them. You know, whereas today, if it was a niche little program on Bravo, for instance, there's no way that anybody would spend that much money making a movie because you wouldn't capture that size of an audience. Now, kind of moving to conclusions here, when I think about these story worlds, what I notice about them that I find interesting about the really successful ones is that they're deconstructible. I can look at the archetypes, I can look at the settings, and all the different elements of them, and pull them apart in my mind. And basically, they take root of my imagination. They come alive, like a good game. You know, I'm actually playing my favorite games in my head after I've walked away from the computer, if it's a really good game. If it's a really good story, I'm imagining, oh, what if Luke had done this? What if Luke had done that? You know? And so I'm actually experiencing the story, or the game, in my imagination, after I've walked away from the actual experience. So, I think there are indicators of ones that are actually taking root in your imagination like that. You know, first of all, if you're like wondering about, you know, I wonder what would happen if, you know, you put an Imperial Star Destroyer versus a Cylon-based star versus a Borg cube. You know, who would win? You know, and this is like little thought experiments. I'm basically playing with the story. I've taken the story and just turned it into a play experience. Um, I wonder, you know, what happens if we send James Bond after Osama bin Laden? Uh, so these are like thought experiments that I enjoy doing. You know in a playful way. There's also like the, wouldn't it be cool if, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I had a magic wand like Harry Potter, or I could fly around the city like Spider-Man. You know, again, these are indicators that has taken root in my imagination, and I'm now actually kind of playing with this as a toy. Of course, we can experience these type of events in games directly. So, if there's anything, the point I'm really trying to make here tonight, it's this, that uh, the best stories, the best story roles I've seen, are inherently deconstructible into components and lead to the largest variety of play. And the best play experience I've seen are inherently generative and lead to the widest variety of story. They're totally interdependent in that sense, that one leads to the other and it's a continuum. And in both cases here, these really, the whole point of this process is that of model building. I'm actually building models in my head, not just of these toy imaginary worlds, but models where I can extract lessons from and you know, apply back to the real world. In some sense, all the different experiences I come across like this, all these different worlds I'm experiencing, I'm pulling into this model building process. And from them, I'm pulling out of these toy worlds the schema, patterns and strategies that I can apply back to the real world. I'm learning lessons in an entertaining way. You know, it might be something very simple, pragmatic, like be careful what kind of mushrooms you eat. You know, it might be something kind of social, like it never hurts to kiss up to the boss's assistant. Uh, or something very profound, like no matter how kind of overbearing and controlling your parents are, there's probably some good in them. <laughs> so, we also learn lessons kind of about the past, present, future. You know, the uh, author of The Sin and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, which is probably the only book I've read more than ten times, wrote a little known sequel called Lula, where he talks about the American cowboy mythos, and how in fact it was stolen from the American Indians, this idea of independence and ruggedness, and living off the land, we actually stole that from the American Indians and applied it to cowboys because that was really the only way to survive on the frontier. And a lot of that was kind of portrayed, not the part of the stealing from the Indians, but the independence in Lone Ranger. 
the Beverly Hillbillies, a lot of people think, was a reaction to hippie culture and how we try to integrate that into the culture of the 60s. The uh, Blade Runner was interesting in that there's probably no piece of fiction more widely cited in urban planning literature today than Blade Runner. It's amazing how many times it comes up when people are talking about neon signs in Union Square or Shinjuku or whatever. Blade Runner is kind of a landmark that's meant to be avoided. Uh, just daily stuff. You know, when I saw, I saw this uh, headline the other day, when I thought, saw that, I thought, oh, I almost saw that happen once. You know? <laughs> and so it's interesting how, again, you start blending these kind of imaginary worlds with real worlds, and they kind of inform each other. So this model building exercise changes our behavior kind of into the future. You know, these can be dystopian views that are kind of warning us off. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke said this, that the best way to prevent the future is to predict it. And that's proven true, you know, countless times. Other things in these story worlds are very hopeful. They give us kind of hope for racial or national harmony. Uh, some allow us to kind of revisit reality in interesting ways. When The Twilight Zone first aired, Rod Serling said it was the only program in which he could actually deal with reality on television because he couldn't deal with civil rights in a program with blacks versus whites, but he could deal with it with aliens versus earthlings and actually deal with real issues of the day by putting them in kind of a science fiction setting. So really, the value of these worlds and these play experiences is the fact that they help us to build and refine our worldview and give us new filters and perspectives on the world. And hopefully, at the very end, we get a lot of fun and we can build communities as well through them. So that's my prepared talk. So thank you. A little right. That was a little right. So, so you know what we're going to do is we're going to open up the floor to some uh, to some questions now. There should be some people with microphones. So you have a you have Nyla's over there. If you have a question, and I would just say you know try to stick to the sport questions. Yeah. They can ask Please. about sport if they want to. All right. Okay. You can ask about sport if you like. Question here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what was the last book you enjoyed reading? Last book I've enjoyed reading? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm usually reading like four or five at once. Uh, Stephen Johnson's The Ghost Map was the last one I really enjoyed a lot. I love the way you can tell a story and combine all these kind of different things. I think he's a great writer. Well, so raise your hand if you have a question. Or will. But the question was, would you please make a new Simcopter game? I would love to play a new Simcopter game, especially with the graphics we have nowadays. Um, I wouldn't mind making it either, actually. Uh, I love helicopters. Okay, someone there at the back. Back, can someone get a mic over there? I'd like to ask, what's the biggest piece of space memorabilia you have? Um, probably the biggest piece I have is the control panel from a Soyuz TM which is about uh, maybe five feet across, about three and a half feet tall, weighs about, oh, 180 pounds. That's probably the biggest single piece. Yeah, it's probably here. All right, over here. I assume you're aware that NASA is making an MMO, and uh, they seem to be getting, uh, trying to get advice from the worldwide audience on what they should do and how they should go about putting it together. Do you have any advice for the team that's going to be building this thing? I was actually at their workshop a couple weeks ago that they had in Ames where they were discussing that. Uh, you know, and the economics are really the hard part of that. Um, and also I think they need to be very clear about what they want to convey with it because people kind of assume that, oh, MMO people will come and play, they'll learn stuff. But it's a little bit more complicated, as we all know, than that. And so I would be, you know, I think they would actually be better off probably spending the same amount of money on a lot of little guerrilla efforts in a more Darwinian process than sinking all their money into one giant project like that. Okay, one, one more question. All right, over here. One more question. Yeah. Have you ever fallen in love with one of your Sims? I'm sorry, say it again? Have you ever fallen in love with one of your Sims? Oh. No, I think I know too much about how they work, you know. <laughs> okay, um, everyone stick around, hang out, the bar is still open, uh, have a great time. Will, thank you very much, everyone. Will Wright.